often referred to as the Sunday of the Open Tomb. Empty Tomb. Because this is the Sunday for those of us who want to find out a little bit more about what this resurrection stuff is about. And if it actually has power to change and shape our lives. Do we say yes? Amen. We're gathered here this morning, and whenever you are watching, we're gathered on the internet, we're gathered here in this place, and we welcome each and every one of you, your presence adds to our worship. Let us discover resurrection together. Jesus will hear the story of Jesus coming to the disciples behind locked doors and breathing peace. And so we pray that you will discover peace in the measure that you need today, in this moment. Just a couple of things I want to uh, highlight. Next Sunday, April 14th, churchwide birthday party after worship, sponsored by the Women's Bible Studies, proceeds going to address hunger in Gaza. And there's a matching uh, uh, donation of, from the Miriam Circle as well. Coming up on April 26, dinner first at uh, 8 at 6. If you uh, just want a nice time of fellowship, there's a sign-up sheet in the narthex. And everyone is welcome. It is a time of uh, getting to know each other and just enjoying each other's company. If you have any questions, you can talk to Margie. Right, Margie? Excellent. Also, Now What is available after worship, a time of discussion, a time of debriefing, a time of conversation. Uh, after worship, perhaps God, uh, you'd like to share what God is whispering to you in this coming hour. 
In this moment, I invite you to breathe. To breathe deeply. Breathing brings life. God wants to breathe upon us this morning. And so I invite you to open the doors and windows of your heart and your mind and your spirit. And let us worship God together. Let us join together in prayer. Into our fears and through our locked doors. Amen. When we think peace be with you means no change or disruption. Amen. Amidst our lives that confuse religious entertainment with Easter fulfillment. For the sake of a community meant to be its best during crisis. Come, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and let us worship God. seated. The Spirit of God helps us in our weakness, interceding with sighs too deep for words, trusting in God's grace. Okay.
first reading from Scripture comes from the 133rd Psalm. And I invite you to listen. This is a pilgrimage song, a song that families and kindred would sing as they made their way to Jerusalem on the pilgrimage to the place where God was present in the temple. So let us hear and listen for God's living word. See how good, how pleasant it is for God's people to live together as one. It is like precious oil on Aaron's head, running down on his beard, running down to the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Mount Hermon falling on the hills of Zion, for that is where the Lord bestows the blessing, life that never ends. The Spirit of God helps us in our weakness, in receding with sighs too deep for words. Trusting in God's grace, let us confess our sin. For Christ, you rose from the depths of suffering, from death itself, to breathe peace upon your disciples. Still, O Lord, we find ourselves unable to trust your promise of peace. Still, O Lord, we find ourselves Show us your hands and your feet once more. And teach us to be your body in the world. Hear the good news. I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young will see visions. Your elders will dream dreams. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Friends, trust in the good news of the gospel.
With caring for ourselves and your neighbor in view, we greet and welcome our fellow pilgrims this morning with a bow of the head, a word of peace, a namaste. Please see close contact for set other settings. May the peace of Jesus Christ be with you. And also continue the Easter story as John tells it in chapter 20 it is the night the first day of the week I invite you again to listen for the living word of God it was still the first day of the week that evening, while the disciples were behind locked doors, because they were afraid of the Jewish authorities, Jesus came and stood among them. He said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. When the disciples saw the Lord, they were filled with joy. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you don't forgive them, they aren't forgiven. Thomas, the one called Didymus, one of the twelve, wasn't with the disciples when Jesus came. The other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. But he replied, unless I see the nail marks in his hands, put my finger in the wounds left by the nails, and put my hand into his side, I won't believe. After eight days, his disciples were again in a house, and Thomas was with them. Even though the doors were locked, Jesus entered and stood among them. He said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. Look at my hands. Put your hands into my side. No more disbelief. Believe. Thomas responded to Jesus, My Lord and my God. Jesus replied, Do you believe because you see me? Blessed are those who don't see and yet believe. Then Jesus did many other miraculous signs in his disciples' presence, signs that aren't recorded in this scroll. But these things are written so that you will believe that Jesus is the Christ, God's Son, and that believing 
you will have life in his name. We are going to sing Dona Nobis Pacem. We're going to sing it in all three languages. I want to invite you to give it a try. I know your Hebrew and Arabic are rusty, but we're going to try because I think it's important to make the attempt. And it doesn't matter how close we are to authentic language. We still seek peace for all. So let us sing together, led by our singers this morning. Verses from the book of Acts, the history, the story of the early church, and it shares with us the possibility of what can happen when a church embraces the good news of resurrection. Again, I invite you to listen for God's living word. Now, the whole group of those who were believed were of one heart and soul. And no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need.
gift of the living word and the written word. Thanks be to God. Does anybody recognize that? Know what that is? It is a, well, it, uh, it's not a prison, it's a vault. Does that help you, anybody? Fort Knox. Fort Knox. The vault at Fort Knox is used to store a large portion of the United States gold reserves as well as other precious items. It currently holds, according to Wikipedia, roughly 147 million troy ounces, that's 4,580 metric tons of gold bullion, a little over half of the total gold presently held by the federal government. If you want to break into Fort Knox, according to locksmithlocator.com, and they're telling the truth, of course, you need to cross four fences, two of which are electric. Then you have to cross the guards loaded with guns and avoid getting caught by surveillance cameras. Next, you walk through the granite walls, which are four feet thick and secured with 750 tons of steel. Then face the 22-ton vault door. You can open the vault with the code number, but unfortunately, none of the staff members there know the full combination code. You need to find the complete code if you want to go inside. After you have unlocked this code, you can go inside to find the smaller vaults that contain more than 5,000 tons of gold. Then, once you have grabbed all the gold, you can come out only to be greeted by a fleet of 30,000 soldiers, artillery, tanks, and helicopters. Considering all this, it's not a surprise that nobody has yet attempted to break into Fort Knox Vault, built in 1935, that we know of, of course. And you know what? The Fort Knox Vault wouldn't be able to keep Jesus out if he wanted to get in. That's what I think the author of John, one of the things that John the Gospel writer is trying to tell us this morning. I think it's a pretty safe bet because the greatest prison in the gospel, in, in the cosmos, couldn't keep Jesus in. He comes and goes as he pleases. But Jesus isn't looking to steal gold or gain power or film a viral TikTok post. He comes and goes to bring peace. He wants to bring peace to us when we are hiding in our vaults. And not only that, he wants to teach us to make peace, to share peace. That's what we're supposed to be about, says Jesus in John's Gospel. And peace is something we need. But instead, it turns out that we are much like the disciples in the Gospel story. Huddling behind our locked doors are 22-ton vault doors because we are afraid. We are afraid of the authorities, the powers that be. We are afraid of risk. We are afraid of change. We are afraid of being vulnerable. We are afraid of losing what we have. We are afraid of hurting. We are afraid of dying. And so we devote more and more energy and attention and our resources to stronger and more sophisticated ways of locking our doors. Well, Jesus comes to us deep in our vaults. And he says, peace be with you. 
And then he sends us out. Puts in the code, opens the doors, takes us by the hand, and ushers us out into the light of day. Even the tomb of death, the vault of death, cannot keep us in. I don't want you to to hide behind locked doors, says Jesus. I want you to open your doors and go out there with good news. And we are presented, as we hear this story, with a choice of what kind of faith we want. What kind of church we want to be. Do we want to be a church of locked doors or open doors? Do you want a faith that hides in the deepest places of our vaults Your vault? Or would you rather come out? Risky as it may be. The faith of open doors stands solidly on the foundation of its core principles and values. It explores new territory. It casts its gaze beyond the horizon and is unafraid of difference and change. The faith of locked doors, on the other hand, is always looking for cracks in the windows, is always besieged by the feeling that the floor is about to give way. It clings to its own territory. It barricades itself behind doctrine and tradition and culture. It is suspicious of the stranger and of difference and resists the change that Jesus and the world bring. And each and every one of us and each and every church as areas and moments of open doors and locked doors. But the good news is that Jesus comes to stand among us because there is no defense that we can put up that can keep Jesus out. There is no locked door or barricaded window that can hold him outside. He comes like a thief in the night, he says elsewhere. And he breathes peace. For the past few weeks, months, during the season of Lent and Holy Week, we have run our fingers over Jesus' scarred hands. And we have put our hands into his side And we are invited to trust. I know the translation says belief. And we tend to think of belief as intellectual assent. But believing in Jesus is less about intellectual assent or committing to a doctrine than it is about opening the doors of our hearts and lives and trusting. Belief is about trust. It is not about having the right theology. We are invited to trust and orient our lives and our ministry standing on core values of love and unity and blessing for all life trust. Unfortunately, if you Google Christianity or if you look up on whatever news aggregator you have or use, if you put in Christianity, you are not as likely to see a church of open doors as you are to see examples of a faith of closed doors. 
You may have noticed that for $60, you can buy a new Bible. Endorsed by former President Donald Trump, $60 will buy you a Bible with a handwritten chorus endorsed by also by Lee Greenwood, song of God, the author, the singer of God Bless the USA. There's a handwritten chorus in that Bible. There's the copy of the U.S. Constitution, the Bill of Rights, the Declaration of Independence, the Pledge of Allegiance. All of that in one nifty volume. And despite what is implied in the website, the profits do go to supporting President Trump. It is an expression, this Bible, this conflation of American documents, historical documents, and God's word of God written, is an expression of Christian nationalism of bringing white Christian nationalism and Christian and American exceptionalism and Christian faith together and making it one and implying that they are the same, that they have the same roots. This is nothing less than idolatry. This courting of Christian faith is embraced by many as a political tool but it is a perversion of Christian faith and all that Jesus stood for. It doesn't breathe peace. It breathes privilege and racism and violence. January 6th insurrection is exhibit number one. This is not a matter of politics. It is a matter of what is happening in our faith. It is not about Republican and Democrat. It's not about, first of all, what's damaging democracy. You can debate that. We can debate that. But this is about our faith and how it hurts those Jesus came to save. This Christian nationalism is dangerous. It is a faith of locked doors, and it is our problem because we say we follow the same Jesus. We who profess a faith of open doors. And if we, we may deny it, we may say, well, that is not the same, but we give it air to breathe if we are quiet, if we are silent, and we can be silent no longer. The mission of this congregation and others like it is vital. Amber Alert. I couldn't have written it better, right? <laughs> Jesus said to his disciples when he gathered with them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you don't forgive them, they aren't forgiven. I think there are dangerous ways of interpreting that. I believe, I take this as a verse where Jesus says, what you do makes a difference in people's lives. And if you don't help to reconcile God and people and bring people together, they are going to remain apart. What we do makes a difference. When we realize that we all have moments when our faith is locked down tight and there are, we all have moments when we open our doors and open our windows. And when we realize that we have opened our doors and all our locks have been opened and we have unblocked the fire escapes when we realize that we are all in the same boat or house or apartment or planet, then we begin to share in the unity that acts and the psalmist talk about in the readings we heard earlier. 
We are a purple church. One of those purple churches, there is not, we are not exclusively blue, not exclusively red. We are purple. We are unified, not by our political ideologies. We are unified by Jesus. And by the calling and the discovery and the sharing and the pursuing and the nurturing of the peace that he came to bring. So let's talk about it. I know not everyone is going to agree with me, thank God, look what God is saying. But together we discover what that peace looks like based on God's word written, we discover and share that living word of Jesus. So we might have those times when we get together and we share and have those sensitive conversations. Because if we can't do it here in this house of love, where are we going to do it? I love that image in the 133rd Psalm of Aaron, the the, the beginner, the ancestor of the priestly line, right? And did you catch that imagery of the oil flowing down and getting on Aaron's beard and then flowing over his collar all over him? I love that messiness, that oil that is meant to be the represent the goodness of God, I believe, that God's blessing and the peace that God gives and salvation and the sharing and the generosity and all of that just flows down all over him. It's messy. And that is Christian faith too. When we get into those messy conversations, And then when we are able to disagree and love each other at the same time and make decisions about moving forward, and yes, I can see now that Jesus didn't mean that, but he does mean this. And we do that together. Oh, it's that blessed messiness that gets all over our beards. I can't grow a beard for the life of me all over George's beard. That's the psalm of First Presbyterian uh, Church. The oil flowing over George and George's beard and over his collar and all of ours. And sharing blessing and speaking out truth. Oh, how messy it is. But getting messy is what happens when Jesus breaks in and breaks us out. Amen. Amen. When the community Jesus started began to embrace the power and promises of resurrection, life was no longer the same. Everything they owned, says scripture, was held in common. With great power, the women and men who followed Jesus gave their testimony to faithful and abundant living, and great grace was among them all. Let us worship God with our giving.
This is the table of grace. It is the table that holds ordinary elements of bread and fruit of the vine, but it showers down oil over us. Because at this table we remember Jesus' love and sacrifice on our behalf. And we are all united around our discovery of peace. You are welcome at this table. It doesn't matter what theology, what ideologies you have, whatever strengths or how old or young you are, whether you can play great pickleball or you just can't hit anything. It doesn't matter. You are welcome and loved and treasured at this table. So come. Let us share in this time together and let us be united in one body and discover peace.
Let us join together in prayer. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to do our thanks and praise. We give you thanks and praise, O God, for the gift of peace you breathe upon us. For the gift of hope you share with us in resurrection. For the gifts of truth, knowledge, and wisdom you give us in scripture, in reason, in compassion, and in experience. For the gift of freedom you give us through grace to choose life for the gift of love that invites us to share and discover your precious oil of love that overflows our cups and run de- runs down our beards and collars. For the gift of beauty and diversity in creation, for the vastness of the universe, and the small hummingbird. For all this, O Lord, and for so much more, we are thankful. You call us to trust, O Lord, and so we come to you with our prayers, our prayers of thanksgiving and of need. Hear our prayers, O God for your church in every place, for the faith that has Jesus at its heart, for this particular congregation and the body of Christ around the world, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers for peace in every land and in every home and in every heart. Lord, in your mercy. For the power to forgive and the humility to ask forgiveness. Lord, in your mercy. For the courage to listen. To be open to hearing your voice in the voice of a neighbor. For unity that is based on deep roots that bind us together. And for nurturing community, we pray, O Lord. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For healing in body, mind, and spirit for all those who suffer. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For justice where there is oppression and understanding where there is division. Lord, in your mercy. For those without homes or food, love or safety, Lord, in your mercy. For those closest to our hearts and those known only to you, Lord, in your mercy. Lord, hear now the particular prayers of this congregation as we lift them up to you. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, in your mercy. Prayer of thanks for miraculous blessing received yesterday. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, in your mercy. Prayers for my extended family, please. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, in your mercy. 
mercy. For all the prayers that remain unspoken, O Lord, Lord, in your mercy. God of heaven and earth, receive our prayers, however ragged they may be, and accomplish your work in the world. Help us to open the doors and windows of our hearts and spirits and institutions. May we nurture life and community and justice and peace. Keep us faithful and hopeful until Christ comes to make all things well. Lord, in your mercy. Healing God, we embrace your vision of shalom for us, for the church, for our communities, for the human family, for all creation. May we, as followers of Jesus, pursue that shalom and nurture unity, truth-telling, and compassion. Pour out your spirit upon us and upon this bread and cup. Make us one in the body and blood of Jesus Christ our Lord. Make our joy complete. Lead us to walk in the light of Christ. Continue to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness for you alone, O Lord, are faithful and just. Through the Lord Jesus Christ and the unity of the Spirit, we bless you, God of glory, now and forever. You call us to trust, and so with confidence we pray as you have taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. On the night of his arrest, Our Savior sat with his kindred and he took bread and after having given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them saying, take, eat, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, after supper, our Savior took the cup said, this cup is the new covenant that is sealed in my blood that is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins whenever you drink it. Do this in remembrance of me. My friends, when you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the saving death of our risen Lord until he comes. These are the gifts of God for you the people of God. Come.
I am the vine and you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit. Let us join together into the vine. We invite you to hold the cup that we might commune together. Letting go of what lies behind and moving forward to what lies ahead, we pursue together the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So says the Apostle, the blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. Let us pray. God of the cross and empty tomb, God of resurrection power, we give thanks for your word of life. We give thanks for you coming to us 
even when we have hidden ourselves away, even when we, especially when we are afraid of so many things. Thank you for opening the doors of our spirits. May we go forth from this place and may we discover and share and experience and rejoice. And may we feel your comfort, your strength. May we know your wisdom and your peace. All the gifts that begin here at this table. Thank you, Lord. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> and tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise the glories of my God and King the triumphs of God's grace the name of Jesus charms our fears and bids our sorrows cease sings music in the sinner's ears bring life and health and together proclaim amen.